So this webinar is to talk about evaluating your outdoor learning space. And um, Sydney, do you want to introduce yourself to my co-host? Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. Hi, um, I'm Cindy Corsair. I'm a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you so much. So we're holding this webinar to talk about evaluating outdoor spaces, outdoor classrooms, um, schoolyard habitat. And this is for the, um, the projects that were awarded the Learning Inside Out grant. But as we said in, in the promo materials, anybody's welcome to join. And I also want to give one more disclaimer that you know, your educators, your teachers, you know about evaluation. We know you know about evaluation. Um, we're trying to talk about what might be different um, when you're talking about an outdoor space, but also break it down so it's not another like heavy testing or evaluation thing. It can be more a little bit more light and fun depending on your, your needs. Um, but I just wanted to preface that to say that we know you know about evaluation. Um, but we're hoping to make it uh, break it down so it's a little more fun and simple for these types of uh, spaces. So let someone in. Okay, um, as I said, this initiated with the Rhode Island Department of Education's Learning Inside Out, which was a grant program in 2023 where the Department of Ed awarded $7.5 million to 89 projects across the state to help them create outdoor learning spaces with the goal of um, promoting equitable, equitable access to natural resources for all students, um, helping promote environmental literacy and community connections. Um, right now, a lot of the projects um, are still working on being installed, which is another reason we're hosting this webinar now. Um, a lot of the districts have chosen to work with <clears throat> what is called an owner's project manager. Uh, it's called Less Fields OPM. And that is someone that Ryan has has helped hire so schools can help implement them spaces. And sometimes there's only about 22 of these uh, 89 projects that are specifically nature-y and are connected to a nearby nature reserve or have a pollinator pathway. Um, some of the projects are, you know, simply making the space safer, more accessible for students, like installing fencing, stairs, things like that. Um, but a lot of the projects are working with left field um, but there have been some supply chain issues, so a lot of them are just getting installed now or uh, will be installed next spring. Um, so I'm based at the Department of Education, but a lot of my work is also in support of the Ryland Farm to School Network. Our statewide director of Farm and Seed to School, Stephanie Pike, and she's based at Farm Fresh Rhode Island. And our network was founded in 2019. Uh, Obviously, Farm to School has been going on in the state for a long time, even if it wasn't just called that. But in 2019, we really were founded to create more of a unifying and coordinating body to help all, um, all the different Farm to School projects throughout the state. We know that sustainability, both funding and, and manpower, woman power to keep gardens going is, is hard. So we're working with schools to train them directly. Um, we host events where, um, you know, Farmers can meet schools to try to sell more local food to them. Um, and we host a lot of training events such as this. Uh, but then we're working on a lot of projects to try to improve the system overall, trying to make it easier for local food purchasing by schools, um, you know, funneling federal grants for that specifically, um, testing innovative programs, um, and then supporting advocacy where we can. And Sydney, do you want to take this one? Yeah. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, so just briefly, um, my role with all of this work and the Learning Inside Out initiative um, is um, sort of the technical assistance um, component for the habitat restoration elements of some of these projects, as Caitlin mentioned. Um, and also, so I work for, um, within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, most people are familiar with our National Wildlife Refuge System. I am located in Charlestown alongside our Rhode Island National Wildlife Refuge Complex, so Ninigrit National Wildlife Refuge, Trustum Pond, if you've been to any of those places. Um, that's us, but I work for the um, part of the service that works um, off refuges. So it's, um, I'm part of our coastal program and we work all throughout Southern New England um, to do conservation and environmental education um, on other types of land. So working with private and municipal partners um, and schools has been one of the um, landowners that I've been working with for several years on these types of projects. Um, and so I've been working with RIDE to try to um, help support from that lens. 
Um, Caitlin, next slide, please. So um, as Caitlin mentioned, we all know that <laughs> you all know what evaluation means and um, why you might conduct an evaluation of any given program or project. Um, so we're looking to um, critically examine uh, these projects and programs to get both to gain information on, um, you know, what the activities are, what the characteristics of these different projects are, and the outcomes of the programs and how you're using your outdoor spaces. Um, and that can tell us a variety of things. Um, but uh, as Caitlin alluded to, we recognize that a lot of this information is not necessarily quantitative. There's a lot of qualitative um, information that can be uh, gathered in a variety of different ways. Um, and the impact of this type of work of outdoor education and with students learning outdoors is um, oftentimes captured in stories or you know, through other means than just data and numbers. So I, I'd want to give that caveat too, that we're not, we don't want to get too hung up on the, the data piece of it, but it really depends on what your audience is and what your, um, how you're going to use this information of what type of information you want to highlight and prioritize. Um, so go ahead, Caitlin, next slide, please. Um, so if you're a participant in the Learning Inside Out um, initiative with RIDE, uh, you should have received, or your district should have received um, one of these Squared Habitat project guides for each of the participating schools. Um, and uh, I'm not gonna go into any detail about what else is in this project, but just to highlight that, um, in the planning of these types of projects, we always emphasize elements that are for both wildlife and people. Um, so making sure you have, you know, as Fish and Wildlife Service, we of course want to encourage, you know, um, habitat restoration elements oftentimes in the form of native plants or pollinator um, gardens, things that will support our local um, wildlife populations, um, but also making sure you have components like, you know, benches and shade and things like that to make sure the space is usable for students and can be a valuable educational space. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that um, we can evaluate our spaces by looking at, you know, the physical space itself and like the maintenance and the growth and the changes of what the outdoor space actually looks like. Um, but then we can also look at it from the side of how it's impacting people and the use of the space and the value that it's providing as an educational tool. And so that's kind of the side of things that we're looking on today is evaluating um, the sort of the people component of uh, a schoolyard habitat or an outdoor classroom. I'll probably use those terms interchangeably just <laughs> out of habit, um, but we all, we all just mean um, outdoor learning spaces. Next slide, Caitlin. So why do we want to evaluate um, outdoor learning spaces? Um, so on a large scale, we know that there's, and the fact that you all are participating in this type of work and that you're here today, um, I'm sure you are aware of that the vast benefits of outdoor learning um, for students in a variety of ways. And these are just some really great infographics from the Children in Nature Network that highlight some of the different um, areas in which outdoor education can be beneficial. So I just wanted to share these as like a large scale, very general sort of information that already exists that you can use um, that's not site specific, but more general about outdoor learning. So it references, um, Time, and time spent in nature, improving academic outcomes, health and well-being, and then um, the benefits to the environment in general. Um, so these are great just for citing, um, great to cite for garnering support from administrators, funders, just kind of when you're framing what you wanna do. Um, and it would be based on their priorities and interests with these three categories. So an example of the type of information that already exists on that larger scale. Next slide, please, Caitlin. So um, moving down from, from that larger scale to more site-specific evaluation. So we have all this general information. We know, you know some of the be general benefits of outdoor learning, but um, what about looking at your specific project and site? Um, so this, this I just kind of came up with this um, circular you know, uh, cycle visual of these three elements, but really they're all interchangeable. It can happen at any, any time, um, but really, Evaluating your site can demonstrate your successes. So is the project and having this space available for your use, is it um, meeting the goals and objectives that you hoped it would as in, in uh, pursuing having an outdoor learning space? 
Um, so it can tell you what those are. It can then identify your next steps and help you adaptively manage if there's something that's not working or something that's missing. If there's a gap, um, you can identify those things and help you move forward and enhance the space. Um, and then you can communicate those messages, whatever it is that you're finding through your evaluation, um, whether that's, you know, um, to the media, if you want to have like, if you would like to have a, um, like a ribbon cutting ceremony or something to kind of really celebrate your space and um, share what you're doing, um, or communicating it to um, your administration or future funders, all of that kind of thing. Next slide, please. So I just want to quickly um, highlight an example of evaluation in action. So this is um, a, a pretty in-depth environmental education program, um, different from more of the on-site outdoor classroom projects that um, are being built through the Learning Inside Out initiative, but the concepts of the evaluation and the information that they gathered from it, I think are still relevant and helpful. Um, so this is called the Philly Nature Kids Program. It is, um, run out of our John Hines National Wildlife Refuge um, in Philadelphia. And uh, they essentially have a partnership with two Title I schools in Philly. Um, and it provides pretty hands-on in-depth, uh, you know, monthly uh, science lessons for fourth grade students. And it also includes monthly visits to the refuge, which is located in the city, which is a very unique and amazing <laughs> um, situation. And they, they really have um, taken advantage of having that resource there. So it's a fantastic program. Um, and we have educators uh, from the refuge who assist with this. Um, but essentially they, they started to look, they've been running this program since 2014, I believe. And they've kept pretty, um, they've been doing evaluation on the, the impact of the program from the beginning. And they found some very um, interesting results and they've been measuring both the, um, from a quantitative and qualitative side. Um, and I think you can go to the next slide, Caitlin. I'm gonna talk about what they found. Um, so from a very like statistical, you know, standardized testing heavy side of things, um, they did find a significant increase in the percentage of students that um, tested at a proficient or advanced level in their standardized testing post participation in this program. Um, and so that is something that, again, don't want to get lost in the numbers too much and don't want to get um, um, overly, um, you know, distracted by the 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 data uh, because a lot of the stories and the things that the kids would tell you that they learned is probably even um, more impressive than the standardized testing scores increasing but depending on the audience that you're talking to this might be really important and really um, uh, a really motivating um, data point to share um, so just an example of how you can actually demonstrate that in a statistical way related to standardized testing um, so this is from one of the schools. It was 9% of this elementary school's class moved from the lowest proficiency to the upper three tiers in the standardized testing. And next slide, Caitlin. This is a little bit more in line with what we're gonna be sharing with you and the approach that we think is most valuable for these types of programs and your outdoor learning space. Um, so this is more about um, attitude and behavior change. So um, not necessarily looking at academic, you know, standardized testing increases, but more, you know, how students feel about the outdoors and how they feel about learning about the environment um, and being comfortable outdoors in nature. Um, students uh, reported that they had an increased understanding of core concepts related to the environment, although you can teach anything outdoors, we're not just saying it's science, um, and that they were more likely to engage in nature dependent activities after participating in the program. Um, and so for the Fish and Wildlife Service, of course, this is exciting to us and really supports our mission. Um, but uh, there are other priorities for, like I said, administrators or funders, um, educators outside of, you know, just the environmental stewardship piece. Um, and so they also collected some more storytelling type data. So they had a fourth grade teacher who I, um, he uh, quoted that the students had an excitement for science and they were thinking more deeply about their learning. They noticed an increased comfort level with science proficiency, um, and uh, they recognize that many factors contribute to those scores, but this one was significant, um, just having the opportunity to be outside. And um, these categories that are shown on the slide, um, I mean, it's pretty, pretty uh, self-explanatory, but it just shows you know, pre and post uh, participation in the program. Um, they reported increased 
in students' interest and comfort and awareness and interest in the refuge. So again, that was because they were part of the program was bringing them to the refuge, but that can be uh, replaced with any outdoor space that they're um, learning in. Um, so this is just an example of the type of data that we can gather um, and how it can be used for different objectives. Um, and I'm happy to go back and talk in more depth about any of this, but um, I will send it over to Caitlin to, <laughs> to wrap us up on the, the slides. Oh, you're still on mute, Caitlin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cindy. So as we mentioned, evaluation is a process. Um, there's figuring out what you want to evaluate, and we urge you to be focused. You don't have to try to capture all the things right away um, to define, you know, what you're going to do with that data, how you're going to change things, whether how you do things or the actual space. Once you get that information, um, who you're going to present it to, that'll really help you decide what you're going to ask. And again, don't feel like you have to capture it all. Um, then obviously there's a collection phase. You know, taking that data back in and analyzing it, um, writing it down, and then figuring out how you're going to share uh, and report it and with who. Um, and we mentioned earlier, a lot of the projects for Learning Inside Out are just getting built now or will be built in the spring. So it's a really great time to evaluate at least some part of your space now before the students um, get outside and start learning in it. Um, we, we have adapted some forms that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have used in, for some of their projects, um, and Kate helped put them into Google Forms, so anybody who registered for this webinar will get, will get a follow-up email this week. Um, we have created some templates uh, in Google Forms for you to make a copy of, um, and we'll send all instructions with, with the follow-up email, but these are some kind of questions. There's a teacher Google Form. Um, talk about how the teachers are using the space, what classes they're um, bringing out there. And then we will have a student form. <clears throat> and we also created, for the younger students, we created a principal form for you. Um, and of course, you don't have to use these. It's just sometimes helpful to get a starting space, uh, to get started with something else. Um, one thing that we will ask, but is absolutely not required, is that when you create a copy of the Google form, if you would consider making us a collaborator, that way we can see the results and kind of track your progress and see if there's anything we can help with. Um, we will be sending out, you know, data requests once in a while to see if you have survey results on your space. But, you know, this, we're trying to help provide professional development and technical assistance as much as we're able to to these projects. Uh, in the future. So anything, any insight we can get or any communications, we'd, we'd really appreciate because we do want to help. We have um, a really great network of environmental educators and farm to school representatives across the state that are also kind of want to help with this effort too. Um, and so, you know, we have forms, uh, like survey forms, but then there are other quick ways to measure impacts. Um, like Cindy mentioned, like how people, how students feel in the space, stories, artwork. Um, you could do a simple word cloud. You could have this, uh, the students go outside and talk about what their space means to them or how they feel when they're there. And you can make a word cloud. And I just think how, you know, how powerful this would be in a PTO meeting um, or with the principal or with other teachers. Um, you know, we have actually have another webinar and I'll share a link to it. Um, that was really great review of all the different ways you could use your outdoor learning space. Um, not just having vegetables or a pollinator pathway, but having or doing science, but having art classes out there, social studies, um, even English learning art. There's a lot of different ways for the school to be able to use this space and the more people use it and see how they can use it um, will really help build sustainability and for the space and for funding and for you know the school to to make it their own um, and some examples of your evaluation results even if it's a one sentence line of you know how students interacted with it or, or the results um, to put it out in the school letter or a parent teacher meetings wellness committee meetings open house 
if you're trying to recruit new volunteers to help maintain the space. Um, one thing the Farm to School Network just started doing is having a Give Butter. Uh, it's a free online fundraising platform. There's no fees associated with it. People can tip optionally when they uh, make a donation and that's how Give Butter is funded. But for you as a user, it, it's free. Um, and that's been really easy to set up. It's sort of like setting up an Eventbrite if you're doing a free event, um, but it's really easy to collect money through that. So you would need to collect it through like a nonprofit bank account, but it's it's a nice way to collect money. And so when you're promoting your project and the impact it's having on the students and the community, um, I think it's a really compelling way to ask for donations to keep it running and keep it going. <laughs> Um, another thing we helped prepare that Kate helped prepare, Kate Ginder, uh, who's also on the farm to school team at Department of Ed, she helped um, prepare some slides. If you wanted to start um, writing about your project um, and present to your school leadership or a parent teacher meeting or trying to recruit volunteers in an open house, we have a, a slide deck that has some templates for you of like what you might want to put on there, what you might want to ask. And again, it's just a starting place. So when we were putting together these slides, I found this as an example. This is a, a PTO website, web page for a school in Massachusetts, and this is about their garden. Um, so they have the you know, story of their garden, how they use it. There's a little infographic about their fundraising, but I see this as a, you know, it's just a single web page. Your school can already ha can host it, um, but you can just talk a little bit about your garden space and then just have a link there for donations, and then you can update this however often you want when you get your evaluation results or student artwork or stories. 